Greetings, saints, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to part two of the series entitled, In Him We Move. And today I'm going to be talking about the missions mandate. I was talking about God is a God, even in times of transition, and sometimes he actually purposes transition in our lives. And how do we embrace this transition? How do we recognize it and respond? So I'm going to read today from the book of Acts, chapter 13, and I'm going to read from verse 1 through to verse 12. And it says, In the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manain, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They traveled, towards, they traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimas the sorcerer, for that's what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimas and said, You are a child of the devil and enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind, and for a time you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately, Mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. Praise God for his wonderful, wonderful word. And we're reading here about a missionary endeavor involving Paul and Barnabas, the apostles there, and uh, how they got sent off through the prophetic word and the power of the Holy Spirit, and how they ended up in this place uh, in Cyprus, where they encountered a sorcerer who was trying to stop the furtherance of the gospel because there was a man who wanted to know more and uh, needed to be saved through the gospel, but this witch was perverting and trying to prevent the progress of the gospel until Paul, through the power of the Holy Spirit, challenged and successfully overcame um, the efforts of this which was trying to stop the gospel. And uh, we're going just to draw some lessons from this and how God speaks to our lives today about motion, about missions, how it happens, who leads us, how do we respond to things like stagnation. And we're going to deal with this today through the word of God. And the first thing that I'm going to touch on, saints, is that there is need for an attitude of mobility, which is demonstrated by... These servants, teachers and prophets, they were, but they were ready to be sent out by the Holy Spirit. And before we delve into that even deeper, one thing that stands out for me is the fact that calling has got nothing to do with association. What do I mean? That one of the men here who was among the prophets and teachers uh, in terms of the founders of the church at Antioch was a man called Manain. And the Bible tells us he was raised up together or raised together with uh, the man called Herod the Tetrarch, whom we know uh, persecuted um, believers, whom we know opposed the Lordship of Jesus Christ and uh, played a part in his crucifixion. And uh, he was a man who was selfish and uh, who was consorting with the Roman oppressors and um, not liked even by the Jewish people because of his behavior and uh, someone who was not devoted to the things of God. He essentially was opposing the purposes of God in his time. Now this man Herod was raised together with this man we're told about here called Manain, who was 
one of the prophets and teachers, the founding prophets and teachers of the early church. And saints to me, that speaks of the fact that God can call you regardless of your association, regardless of your past, regardless of your race and bad things that have been done by people of your race or bad things that have been done by people of your blood, your bloodline, your family, bad things that have been done by people in your country, bad things that have been done by your friends or what God doesn't look at that. This man raised together with Herod, an evil man, was one of the prophets and teachers in the early church. So saints, it means that as long as you desire to serve the Lord, your past, your associations, your links, your relationships cannot hinder the powerful and meaningful call of God over your lives. And the next thing I'm going to talk about is the importance, of course, here of defined ministries. The Bible clearly says there were prophets and teachers. And this shows us that saints, the gifts of the Spirit and the offices of the Spirit are very important for the functioning of the church. And uh, the Bible it doesn't mince words here. It's very clear. There were prophets and teachers. And there, I'm sure there were other gifting, giftings as well. And now if these gifts were essential for the early church that we know was very effective today, we are here because the early church was faithful. It means even today, if we are going to see the same God we read of in the book of Acts, then we need to imitate the same thing. They had prophets and teachers and other giftings. We need prophets and teachers in the church today to find giftings of ministries, not to do uh, with what people think that the church is about. It's just a social club and people just go up and meet up and while up time. Specific people have dedicated their time to seek the Lord, to study the word and to lead. And they're not ashamed to be called prophets and teachers. Of course, people must not get puffed up because they've got an anointing or a calling to be a prophet, a teacher, or someone who moves in healing and all those things. But at the same time, we shouldn't shy away from it. And the Bible actually names names. And these were people who were called by these specific offices. That's why even Paul, for instance, says we should not be ignorant about spiritual gifts. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, we must seek out what the gifts are. And the Bible tells us, particularly the New Testament, 1 Corinthians is good uh, to show us the different kinds of gifts, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. It's up to us to seek out and to understand what your gifting is. Are you called to preach? Are you called to teach? Are you called to be an evangelist and bring the lost into the kingdom? Are you called to manifest the power of Jesus Christ, confirm that Jesus is alive through praying for people and they are healed, praying for people and they are delivered from demonic power? You have a calling and a specific gift, but you shouldn't be ignorant. Seek it out, pray, and study the scriptures. And the Bible also says eagerly desire. Paul says eagerly desire spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1 and he says especially the gift of prophecy so we are to desire these gifts and God wants us to purposely want to function in the gifts in as much as the Bible says we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to fulfill good works he's already prepared in advance for us but if we don't desire it we may actually not fulfill it do you want to serve the Lord do you want to see the anointing of God and the Holy Spirit move through you that when you preach when you teach when you serve when you give when you sing things happen and people are drawn to jesus christ and chains fall well you have to desire it and you have to be knowledgeable about this and you find that the anointing here we learn from this passage that the anointing is always to go in as much as they were worshiping the lord they were full of the holy spirit the offices were there the giftings were there the manifestation of the Spirit was there, but it was for a purpose. It was to go. When the Holy Spirit spoke, he was setting apart people to go out and preach the word. And saints, we must not get too comfortable with clicks. You know, God gives us the Holy Spirit. God gives us the gifts in their various forms, not so that we can enjoy uh, the man basking in manifestations of the Spirit and we feel the power of the Holy Spirit and we fall over and we enjoy it and we say, oh, wow, even though there's nothing wrong with enjoying the manifestation of the gifts, but the gifts are for mission, saints, so that we can go out there and preach. And this is what the Holy Spirit, that's the first thing we hear the Holy Spirit say in this passage, set apart for me, Saul and Barnabas, for the mission. And if you want to be filled by the Holy Spirit, then you have to be mission-minded. You have to be ready to serve, ready to go and preach, ready to go and uh, administer deliverance to people who do not know the truth about Jesus Christ. So the anointing is not for our fleshly convenience. 
We must not be a people who are so bogged down on wanting to be a small little clique comfortable and you're not welcoming to new people. You're not welcoming to unbelievers and people come in who look a bit rough and who look like they've got issues with addiction or whatever it is and you feel when you see them that they're disrupting your clique. That is ungodly. That is satanic. We are not called to live in cliques. Yes, it's good to have good, meaningful, long-standing relationships. But if that clique now stands in the way of being mission-minded and inviting new people to come to church and be saved, something's wrong. We need a Jesus-friendly church. Many people talk about seeker-friendly churches, and there is a place for that where people should come in, hear the gospel, and they are comfortable. But I believe a church, a church that is Jesus-friendly will definitely be seeker-friendly. Is your church are your prayer meetings Jesus friendly? Would Jesus be happy with the way you pray, the way you preach, the way you talk, the way you relate to one another, the way you administer the gifts, the way you arrange your program, the length of time? Would Jesus be happy? Is your meeting, your church Jesus friendly? If not, then we have to check that. We are not given the anointing of the Holy Spirit for our convenience, but to serve the Lord. Then the next thing, saints, is that when we do move into the mission, and we do missions, it must be by obedience and not by fleshly planning or desire. It is the Holy Spirit who spoke. Now, saints, when the body of Christ is healthy and it is active, the Holy Spirit plays an active role. It's amazing how the scripture here records the Holy Spirit speaking. And the Holy Spirit is spoken of uh, as if he's one of the members of that church, as if they were speaking about Paul or Niger or one of the other people there, it's as if someone, one of them, just stood up among them and shows us that the Holy Spirit was so real to them. And they speak of the Holy Spirit as someone who just would stand up and speak. And saints, God wants his spirit to be as real with us today, where he speaks and we hear him, we listen, we understand, and we apply a living practical relationship with the Holy Ghost. And Paul and Barnabas, who was called Saul then, that's Paul, were sent off on mission. And now if you want to serve the Lord, you want to do things, make sure you're being sent by the Holy Spirit and you're not trying to imitate someone else or doing it for selfish reasons. We should be moved by the Holy Spirit. And the, one of the other interesting things here that happens is that once the Holy Spirit speaks, it was during a time where they were ministering by worshipping and fasting. And just to emphasize on that as well, that when we do minister, when we do come together, it must be to minister to the Lord. The Bible says they were worshipping and fasting and ministering unto the Lord. And I was talking just now about a Jesus-friendly church. The songs we sing, the way we do things. Do you sing a particular song because it simply sounds nice to you? You like the tune or it's dancing enough for you or it's a hymn, it's nice and calm? Or do you sing that song because the Holy Spirit has led you to sing that song unto the Lord? People talk about church culture. Yes, different churches in different locations will very well have different shades of culture in terms of being conservative or not. Loud in terms of youth, in terms of different things, the dominant language, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the dominant culture ultimately must be a culture that is pleasing to the Lord, where if Jesus would walk into that meeting, you'd be happy with what you're speaking and how you're relating and behaving, ministering unto him, singing songs that you know he wants you to sing. It's not simply because you enjoy them. Dancing the way you believe would minister to him and all that. And they were ministering unto the Lord. Now, as they were doing this, the Holy Spirit spoke. And when he spoke, I was thinking, look, if it was me and the Holy Spirit spoke, I'd say, oh, why should we continue fasting? Why should we continue worshiping? We've heard the Lord. Let's just do it. But that's not what um, the prophets and teachers at Antioch did. They continued to fast until they commissioned Paul and Barnabas. Saints, when you begin to function in the power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that is not a cue for you to relax your spiritual disciplines. And um, the apostles here and the, the prophets and the teachers here didn't relax simply because they heard the Holy Spirit. In fact, possibly they intensified, they continued. And sometimes as believers, we can, I've made that mistake sometimes because suddenly you see the power of God begin to flow. You see answer to prayer and you sort of take your foot off 
uh, the, the pedal and you take your foot off the accelerator and you think, okay, now we're moving. No. The Bible says uh, pride comes before a fall. When you feel most secure, that's the most dangerous place to be. Jesus would minister by day and pray by night. He wouldn't relax and say, oh, did you see the people I raised from the dead and the lepers healed? Also, let's have a party, guys. He would actually, after that, go and pray. And saints, we must not relax on fasting and praying and saying, oh, that's for the youngies who are still, you know, have got milk on the nose and who are, are still full of zest and energy. Uh, in Shona, they would say, Vane Zungu. No. The more mature you are, the more you need to be consistent, I believe, in terms of the spiritual disciplines like fasting, worshiping the Lord. So dependence of the Holy Spirit, saints, is a must and a necessity. And in fact, the Holy Spirit, he is more important and he remains more important than the gift given by the Holy Spirit. So if it's a gift of teaching, it must be submitted to the Holy Spirit. And uh, it must not cause you to rebel and you must not suddenly begin to find your identity in the fact that you can prophesy, you can pray for the sick and uh, things happen. The Holy Spirit remains the one who directs you when to pray, who to pray for, how to pray. And all those things we must remain dependent on him. Otherwise, our hearts can grow cold and we cease to be effective. And that takes me to the next thing which can happen, which is stagnation. And what, are, what do I mean when I'm talking about stagnation? Stagnation is opposition that essentially halts the progress, the momentum of the Holy Spirit. You're moving and suddenly there's a stop which is not anticipated, which you don't want. The fruit begins to die down. That the healings are not taking place as much. People are not turning to the Lord as they should. The answers to prayer don't seem to be happening. The life of the Spirit doesn't seem to be manifesting, even though it was before. There is a stagnation and a frustration happening. And saints, um, stagnation can happen even to the best of us. And now here it happened to Paul. On an anointed assignment, sent by the Holy Spirit. So when you are facing stagnation in your life, in whatever area, as a leader... As a, as a father, as a mother, as a pastor, as an evangelist, even as a leader in, in the business world, as a believer who's leading in the business world, it doesn't just mean that you're doing the wrong thing. It could be you're actually on your anointed assignment, but the enemy is just opposing you, as happened here with Paul. And what is this stagnation? What are we talking about? It's when there's a direct challenge to the purpose, the manifestation of God's power in your life. The manifestation of God's gift in your life, the calling, whether it's in business, it's in preaching, it's in teaching, it's in Sunday school, it's in evangelism, and the doors seem to just shut tight. And there's a frustration, there's an exasperation that happens there. You could hear, you could sense the exasperation as Paul spoke there, and he says to the sorcerer, will you not stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? And he was exasperated, but... When I'm talking about this exasperation, this choking of the spirit, the smothering of life where you have to respond and you feel you're dying inside and you have to break that downward spiral, that exasperation, desperation to breathe again. There's different kinds of exasperation. Now, when we say being exasperated or stagnation in this sense, we're not just talking about general life stagnation where you're frustrated by different things. The reality, in this world, we will have brokenness. We will have people depart. We will lose people in different ways. Uh, financially, sometimes we may struggle. Health-wise, sometimes we might have challenges. That doesn't mean we've departed from God. But when I'm talking about this stagnation and exasperation that we need to respond to, it's when the purpose of God is no longer flourishing in you. Because you can still be going through a difficult time, dear saint, but still know that you're doing the will of God. Still know that you have God's peace inside of you. In spite of the challenges you're facing, you've still got his joy. And you are still seeing God work through you, through the various gifts. And that's fine. But when you're feeling a choking in your spirit and the joy, you've lost it. The peace is gone. Then you have to challenge it. And that's what Paul did. He didn't stand by and say, oh, this is just a, a broken reality. There are times, which is why even the book of James says in James 4 verse 7, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. There are times we need to resist the devil. When you've submitted to God and you know that God's purposes are being thwarted, not my selfish purposes, but God's purposes, then you have to stand up and say, no, 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 no. 
Jesus paid the price for this. Satan, you cannot stand against the church of God. Jesus said, I'll build my church and against it, the gates of hell will not prevail. And Paul stood up. And saints, you have to be in tune. When you sense an exasperation, you sense your spirit choking. It's one of two things. Either you are not in the will of God and perhaps you're living in sin deliberately and you're not you're refusing to repent. You are living in rebellion. God has called you to serve him and you're trying to look out for yourself and make lots of money but you know you're called to preach and teach and that can cause you exasperation and the life in you is being smothered because you've moved away from God's purpose and the enemy will attack your peace or it could be you are like Paul and Barnabas on a truly divine mission but it's just satanic opposition and what do you do the Bible tells us you revert back to the Holy Spirit when Paul challenged this sorcerer the Bible says full of the Holy Spirit he looked at him and said and he pronounced the judgment of blindness of temporal blindness on Elymas he didn't just do things um, out of his own understanding he waited to be filled and the Holy Spirit told him so when you are facing a challenge and you believe that is the work of God that's being challenged not your own personal agenda then ask the Holy Spirit, how are you to respond? And there are times of frustration. I'm reminded of a time we went to minister in a place called Kotwa, here in Zimbabwe, close to the Nyamapanda border between uh, uh, Mozambique and Zimbabwe, and we were preaching the gospel there, and suddenly things began to dry up as we were ministering. We were doing a two-week crusade. And suddenly the power of God was not flowing as, as clearly as it was. And you could sense that there was something holding, something binding in the atmosphere. There was no freedom. And uh, I asked the Lord and said, Lord, what's going on? And he pointed out one particular, particular young lady who was coming in for counseling in quotes every day for some days. And he said, that woman is not coming for counseling. She is an agent of the devil. Because she would come for counseling, but she would refuse to receive prayer. And I just thought, look, we need to be patient with her. And there are times, of course, we do need to be patient. And I just thought, look, she will come around. And the Holy Spirit says she's not going to come around. She's an agent of the enemy. Confront her. Pray for her. And see what's going to happen. And she came again, like clockwork, again on that day. And I said, today we're going to pray for you. And she said, no, I didn't ask for prayer. I don't. And then I said, why are you coming? The Holy Spirit told me to pray for you. And I prayed for her, and these demons manifested. And um, But she didn't want to be helped. It turned out, and she walked away. And she never returned. But the amazing thing is, after that encounter, suddenly there was open heavens. The power of the Holy Spirit began to flow again. So saints, you have to be in tune. When you sense that exasperating choking of spiritual life in you, don't ignore it. Ask God what's going on. Perhaps there's someone that you're relating to, that you're connected with in business or connected with, in, uh, that you're playing around with, that is not good for your spiritual journey. And they are there just to drain you and nothing good is going to come from that relationship. Perhaps there's an area of sin that you're entertaining and the Holy Spirit will show you that you have to stop living like this and entertaining this thing. And when you repent, you confess it, you let go of it, suddenly you find you're flowing again with the power of the Holy Spirit. So saints, there is a reason why sometimes we feel that exasperation. And like I said, sometimes in life we go through opposition, we go through pain and struggles. But the life of the Spirit in us must never be choked. We must always sense the peace and the joy and the assurance of the Holy Spirit in us. That must never change. Because Jesus says, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. So that peace must not go away. When your peace is being challenged and your the spirit of a sound mind that the Bible says you've got is no longer holding intact. And it's almost like your mind, you're losing your mind, you're going in the doldrums of depression. Don't ignore that. Go back to the Holy Spirit and ask him, what's going on, Lord? What do I need to do? And he'll tell you where you need to resist and what you need to do. And once you do that, you'll find that the life of the Spirit will flow again, even if the challenges persist, but it will not take away your peace and your joy. Then the last thing, saints, I want to talk about now is that we need to remember that ultimately it's all about the gospel. It's about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's amazing how the proconsul came to the faith. And the Bible says, when Paul pronounced that judgment, the proconsul was amazed. Now, listen to this. The Bible doesn't say he was amazed because of the power of the Holy Spirit manifested the judgment, the miracle. The Bible says he was amazed because of the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the teaching of the Lord, saints, is amazing. When people are not 
seeing the teaching of the gospel, how Jesus came, God in the flesh, died for our sins in our place, rose again from the dead, sent the Holy Spirit for us, how he's coming. And if that doesn't amaze you, there's probably satanic opposition because the gospel is amazing. The gospel is wonderful. That's why, for instance, you see in Acts chapter 8, verse 4 to 7 in, in Samaria, you find there that there was deliverance. Um, there was joy in, in Samaria because there's Philip was preaching the gospel. People were delivered from demonic power. The gospel always has a tangible, positive impact. Acts chapter 8, verse 34 to 39, when Philip ministered to the eunuch, um, you find that there was great joy. The Bible says the eunuch went away rejoicing because he had received revelation on the way of salvation. He'd received eternal life. In Acts chapter 13, verse 49 to 52, uh, Paul, in Pisidian, um, and Paul and, and Barnabas in Pisidian Antioch, though they were being forced to leave that place prematurely in a sense and not preach the gospel anymore because of persecution. But even though they left under difficult circumstances, the Bible says the disciples were still filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. In other words, they received spiritual stamina because of the gospel they had heard. The gospel always had some positive impact on people's souls and spirit. That's why it's called the gospel, good news. And this is what the enemy fights. And when these things that I've mentioned are not happening, there's probably some witchcraft, some demonic interference which we need to ask the Holy Spirit about and we come against it in Jesus' name and God brings forth the gospel. And we have to ask ourselves, therefore, saints, are we ready to lay down our lives so that this gospel can spread? What do I mean when I say lay down our lives? I'm not saying that you should seek to put yourself deliberately in harm's way and be killed. If that's going to be part of your calling, well, the Lord knows. But what I'm saying is this. It's obeying the Holy Spirit at all costs. And he tells you, go and preach in that remote town. He tells you, preach to this relative and preach to your workmate. Go and preach at that location. And regardless of what people say, whether you're going to be rejected, you're going to be persecuted, you obey the Holy Spirit. That's what I mean when I say laying down our lives. And when we do that, saints, we are now fulfilling the mission's mandate. We will resist the devil and he will flee and we will release God's divine life. And saints, saints, in him we move. May we move in obedience to the Holy Spirit. May we move in obedience to the call and the purpose of God upon our lives. May we move in such a way that we're able to resist the stagnation of the enemy and let God's life continue to flow even in times of difficulty. May we move in such a way that even when the enemy tries to bring stagnation, by the anointing and the fullness of the Holy Spirit as we see in this passage, we can call out the enemy and speak God's mind and prevail. And know that when we depart from this earth, we'll meet the Lord and he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant, because we'll have fulfilled our calling. So be blessed, saints, and be ready to be in motion. Serve the Lord. Ask the Holy Spirit. Serve him for his purposes, not for selfish reasons. And be led of the Holy Spirit at all times. Be blessed, saints, in Jesus' name.